Well, welcome to this discussion, which is part of our Greater China series. Today's edition is sponsored by Asia City Trust, and we'll be taking on the topic of robust strategies for protection of wealth and assets for high net worth Chinese and cross-border families. Today, we'll look at three jurisdictions with the Asia City team, New Zealand, Cook Islands, and Hong Kong. For each of these jurisdictions, we're going to discuss key features, concerns and considerations, and possible solutions for clients to consider. First up, we're going to look at New Zealand with Asia City's local managing director, Kate Weiss. Welcome, Kate. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you today about New Zealand, Asia City, and the solutions available to meet the needs of Chinese and cross-border families. New Zealand has been ranked by the World Bank as the easiest place in the world to do business. Kiwis have held the top spot in the World Bank's annual ranking since 2015. The country follows the British Westminster parliamentary system and has a monarchy set up with the government led by our Prime Minister Jacinda Ahern. Boasting a gross domestic product of 205.9 billion United States dollars, New Zealand has enjoyed positive growth for 33 out of the last 35 years, putting the country head and shoulders above um, its comparable nations. Since 2010, the country has seen an average annual growth of 2.1%. New Zealand is officially the least corrupt nation in the world. It has topped the Transparency International's list for the past two years, making it a firm favourite for people who want to do business in the Australasia um, area. Auckland, where I am based, has recently been announced as the world's most livable city following a study by the Economist Intelligence Unit. Part of this is based on the fact that New Zealand has done a remarkable job of controlling COVID-19. It has reported just 26 deaths from the disease in total. Um, hopefully we will be order, uh, opening our borders later this year as well. This has seen a real uh, positive impact on our clients and our partners. We have had very few weeks of um, lockdown in Auckland, meaning that we have been able to run unlimited services for our clients. New Zealand is neither considered a tax haven nor an offshore jurisdiction. We have a, rep a really good reputation, which has further been boosted by um, the recent FAF report, which set out that New Zealand was one of the best jurisdictions in seizing criminal profits. This has given New Zealand this reputation with tax authorities and with governments around the world that we're not corrupt, that we have strong um, anti-money laundering procedures, and therefore we're not seen as a typical offshore tax haven jurisdiction. What concerns and considerations do our Chinese and ultra high net worth cross-border families have? Geographic diversification is a major benefit to our Chinese and cross-border families who use the New Zealand jurisdiction. Protection from the reach of governments and third parties across the Asian continent is ensured through New Zealand's political stability. Geographic diversification means something different to um, families based in Asia than it does to those based in Europe and the US, where seizures by governments and seizures by third parties don't tend to happen. But across Asia and, and our, 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 our other clients in Latin America, it's a real possibility. New Zealand is not afraid to stand up to foreign governments either. The Chinese Foreign Ministry recently set out that it was deeply concerned with comments made by our Prime Minister um, when she expressed concern um, about Chinese actions in Hong Kong, Xinjiang and the South China Sea. Recent events have also heightened an awareness that succession planning and the transfer of wealth should be carried out as a structured long-term strategy as soon as possible. Patriarchs and matriarchs of high net worth families have been forced to grapple with estate planning. This is not an easy process because talking openly about succession with Asian families is sometimes seen as inauspicious and can even be taboo. Family values and government governance are key. Whilst an important factor is tax planning and asset protection, this shouldn't drive the family's uh, succession. The, what is important with um, family succession 
it are the objectives, the traditions, the behavior and the values of the family. And it's only by listening and understanding these can we actually tailor a solution which meets the family's needs. Giving up control is also a major consideration for high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals and families wherever they are based. Quite often, the matriarch and patriarch have developed their wealth through their own abilities and passing to outsiders or to second generations can be really difficult. International families require independent fiduciary advice with multi-jurisdictional expertise. Though today's wealthy, especially those in China, have built their wealth as self-made um, entrepreneurs, conflicting priorities may arise during wealth tr transfer, because in particular with Asian families, there is no clear distinction between personal wealth and the wealth of the business. Moreover, many, uh, much of family wealth and assets are spread across different jurisdictions, rendering taxation and regulatory compliance more complicated. So now let's talk about these solutions. We have a range of solutions in New Zealand, which we are very excited to share with you all. New Zealand has recently updated its Trust Act in 2019, which came into effect in January this year. This gave us a great opportunity to really look at our trusts because we had to update them anyway because of the implementation of the Trust Act and to look at the needs of our Asian and ultra high net worth clients across the globe and develop solutions which we can tailor made, make to these clients, but also that are dynamic enough to meet the challenges that we face in 2021. For example, families who are happy to give up control of an asset but wish to appoint specific investment managers to look after the investments that they place into the trust. This could be a family member or friend and they would like to enshrine the investment management into the trustee so that the trustee doesn't have the control or the power to change the investment manager. So we have a solution that carves out the investment manager role and means that the family are able to appoint successive investment managers as they should wish. Some families wish to benefit from geographic diversification, but don't wish to, wish to um, give up control of assets. With these families, we can set up trust, different types of trusts. The person who sets up the trust may wish to reserve some of the powers. This could be investment management. So rather than delegating investment management to a family member or to a third party, they may wish to retain investment management themselves or investment direction. The other thing they may wish to retain is the ability to direct the trustees when making a distribution or whether to make a loan to a family member. And these, can, these powers of the trustee can be carved out and retained by the person creating the trust. We also have another option available called a special entity carve out. And this idea has been designed for families who own their own businesses. These families may have companies which are trading companies, operating companies, property companies, or investment companies. In these situations, quite often the family wish to retain um, directorship of the company, but when you place an asset into trust, what you're doing is you're giving the shareholder, you're making the trustee the shareholder of the company. And quite often the shareholder has a lot of control over the director. And this can put off Asian families and ultra high net worth families of putting family companies into trust. So what we've done is created a structure which says that the trustee its duty is to retain the shares in the family business and um, it can't interfere in the directorship of the company and it can't interfere in the day-to-day -day running of the company. So this solution probably um, sounds like the BVI Vista Trust or the Cayman Star Trust, which allows the family to retain control of the company and remain as directors without having the interference from the trustees. The directors run the company. However, they will have to supply the trustee with the financial statements of that company on an annual basis, and they will have to ask the trustee if they can make distributions to family members, or make loans to family members or other individuals. But apart from that, the trustee has no say in the day to day running of the company. One of the most exciting elements of the new Trust Act in New Zealand is the adoption of the special advisor regime. The special advisor can be based in the jurisdiction where the family are based and it could be the, a family member or it could be uh, the family advisor that advised the family for, for many years and they want them to be involved in the trust going forward. What this special advisor is able to do is advise the trustee. So it's quite a different role from that of protector, which we've seen traditionally, and it's quite a different role from being the investment manager of the trust. All of the decisions that the trustee make can be made in conjunction with a family advisor who is based in a location or um, that's suitable for the family. 
in those circumstances as well, the family, uh, the special advisor is not a protector, is not a trustee, and therefore doesn't have their information exchanged under the information exchange mechanism, such as the common reporting standard, CRS or FATCA. Another element which came out under the new act is this ability to delegate the custody of assets. So the trustee can be the trustee, the legal owner of the assets, but can delegate the custody of these assets to a third party. And perhaps that could be in the jurisdiction where the family live. This also allows us to uh, beat the challenge that time zones present to us, but still gives the family the, um, the advantage of having geographic diversification in New Zealand and to benefit from the reputation of New Zealand and the other elements that I brought up at the beginning of this session. In some cases, the family may wish for the trustee um, to be bespoke to their needs. Some family members might want to be a part a trustee. And um, like in other jurisdictions, we have this concept of the private trust company in New Zealand. These companies allow families to own and or be directors of the legal owner of their assets. So later on, my colleague Tinny is gonna talk about purpose trusts, and that's a really good way of holding these private trust companies. And when we speak um, later on in the case study, we're gonna look at how a private trust company can be used by Chinese families in the most effective way. Some jurisdictions don't recognize the concept of trusts, and sometimes trusts may not be the best um, or most suitable vehicle to undertake some family succession planning. So in New Zealand, we have a strong and sophisticated limited partnership regime. For example, what we've recently done for a Chinese family is they wanted to pool family funds to uh, invest in a new family business venture, but also to invite uh, external investors to invest in that venture. And what we've done in that circumstance is created a New Zealand limited partnership um, so that they can have the benefits of the New Zealand reputation and geographic diversification, as well as pooling the family's assets to have better bargaining power and bargaining strength when it came to the new business venture. So thank you very much for your time um, today to talk through um, what we have in New Zealand. Um, and I look forward to talking to you later when it comes to the case study. Thank you for that, Kate. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Tine Ponya, from, who's Managing Director of Asia City in the Cook Islands. Welcome, Tine. Greetings, everyone. I'm Tine Ponya, the Managing Director of Asia City Trust in the Cook Islands. I am very pleased to be speaking to you all today um, about the key features of the Cook Islands as a jurisdiction. And I will also touch on common concerns by Chinese clients and the solutions available in the Cook Islands. The Cook Islands is an independent self-governing island nation in free association with New Zealand, which means its people are New Zealand citizens and they use the New Zealand currency. The Cook Islands has a parliamentary system of government of the type originated in England, it has a strong judiciary, which is essential given it's the courts which give recognition to trusts. The Cook Islands International Trust Act has been around for almost 40 years. So Cook Islands practitioners understand what trusts are and what is required for their proper administration. The Cook Islands is well known for its highly robust asset protection laws making it the premier asset protection jurisdiction. It has strong privacy laws with no public registers for beneficiary and set law details. And it's an offense to disclose any information about an international trust, except as prescribed by legislation. The Cook Islands doesn't feature on any blacklist and was recently rated as having one of the best AML CFC regimes. The Cook Islands has implemented FACTA and CRS into its laws. And finally, Cook Islands International Trust is not subject to taxation. Often we hear concerns by Chinese families about the need to protect their assets against potential claims from those who attempt to take them by force, litigation or legislation. They are also concerned about ensuring their children inherit their, their wealth with ease and that any associated risks are appropriately managed. And while these concerns are important, Chinese families also want to hold on to control of their assets. This brings me to the products that are available in the Cook Islands that can help address the concerns of high net worth Chinese clients. For asset protection, the Cook Islands is well known for its asset protection trusts. These are discretionary in nature 
which means if the beneficiary becomes bankrupt or is sued personally, assets held in the trust are protected against those claims because they don't form part of the beneficiary's property. The trust contained due risk and excluded person provisions, meaning no excluded person can ever benefit from the trust and actions done under duress are invalid. Under Cook Island's law, if a claimant wants to attack the assets of the trust, they must sue the set law within 12 months of the date of transfer of assets, as well as commencing an action in the Cook Islands against the trustee within 24 months of the date of transfer of assets to the trust. The claimant must prove his or her case to the high standard of beyond reasonable doubt. In the event the claimant is within the limitation period and successfully argues a fortunate transfer case, the only remedy available is to seek recovery of the, of the property that would have been available had the transfer to the trust not occurred. The Cook Islands doesn't recognize any overseas judgment that is inconsistent with its asset protection rules. And a Cook Islands trust can't be void because the set law is bankrupt, insolvent or in liquidation. If a set law's main concern is protection, but would still want some control over how the assets are managed, a standard asset protection trust with a Cook Islands trustee and reserved powers to the set law to invest and manage assets might be the ideal structure for that set law's needs. Otherwise, the Cook Islands offer other products such as purpose trust, private trustee companies, which can work in combination with asset protection trusts. The Cook Islands law allows for purpose trusts which do not have charity as their objects, and for private trustee companies or PTCs that can act as trustee for up to three trusts. A purpose trust can be set up to own a PTC that can act as trustee for up to three asset protection trusts. The purpose trust is a good succession planning tool as the ownership of the PTC will not be affected by the death of the set law. The set law can become a director of the PTC and therefore retains control over the trust. And the fact three separate trusts can be set up under the trusteeship of a PTC gives the ability to diversify risks. Lastly, Cook Islands law permit dynasty trust with no perpetuity period, therefore making it an excellent multi-generational succession planning tool. Thank you very much and I look forward to talking to you more on what the Cook Islands has to offer. Thank you very much, Tina. And um, finally, from Hong Kong, uh, welcome Kali Ching, uh, Managing Director there for Asia City's uh, local office. Hi, oh, hi. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. And um, hello, oh, I am Kali from Hong Kong. So uh, today, I think most of you guys already know about Hong Kong, but maybe I'll just give you a little bit of like uh, updates or some details about um, Hong Kong and then the tax, right? Okay. Hong Kong law system is actually developed based on English common law and the local legislation. We have a very simple tax system in Hong Kong, and we use and uh, we use the territorial basis system. The profit tax rates uh, in Hong Kong is just like from 8.25% to 16.5%. Uh, we have no VAT, and then we have no capital gain tax, and then we have no estate duty. So um, the Hong Kong government has an initiative to further promote Hong Kong as an international financial center. Recently, we have introduced a new legislation on limited partnership funds and have offered like 0% tax rate for the carry interest receipts. So um, in Hong Kong, we all know that we have got supplies of uh, uh, legal and accounting professionals to support the deals and the, and the structures that um, we and uh, our client wanted to do. Okay, this just briefly about Hong Kong and then um, just want to give you some updates about uh, what happening at the moment or what happening in last year. So um, I think last year we all experienced a very difficult time, right? Uh, in Hong Kong, we have lockdowns for a few months and then we have uh, all these social distancing measures like many other places in the world. Uh, but all this did not, did not stop the city from moving forward. Our capital markets were very active in Hong Kong in last year, and also were very active now as well. So we raised second largest IPO poses in the world last year, like the first being uh, NASDAQ. In 2020, it was it also a record high year for the wealth management sector here. So on top of that, 
We will soon to have our wealth management connect system in the Greater Bay Area. And we have, um, and we see some of the uh, financial institutions are uh, all getting ready for the capital fraud within the um, Greater Bay Area. For example, like HSBC, like the other day, the other day says they plan to hire like 5,000 customer facing wealth planner in the next five years to actually support the growing um, demand in the region. So all this add up to the increase in demand for wealth management services like banking, insurance, as well as trust services um, in Hong Kong. For example, uh, we see a lot of demand for PIPO trust, employee benefits trust, and then the family office related services. We also see clients become more sophisticated and then structures becoming more complicated. Purely having one Hong Kong office definitely will not sufficient to fulfill all these requirements for our local clients from China and Hong Kong. So, um, so this is why uh, we need our colleagues like from Cook Island and then from New Zealand to actually help our, um, our to structure for our uh, clients' needs and uh, requirements. When we talk about the concern of the Chinese high net worth individuals and then cross broader, broader uh, families, I think the most um, the more concern is how to uh, which jurisdiction to go for uh, when they want to set up the trust whether they should go, whether they should use Hong Kong or some offshore jurisdiction when they are talking about, talking about setting up the trust. And then, um, and then another concern is um, they would like to have retain as much control as possible. They want to control the trust. They want to control the trustee and then they want to control the trust assets. So we are, we always like as Kate said, like we have to teach we have to talk to the client. We have to ask the client to strike the balance when we are structuring. And then, um, and then one more concern or consideration that the, the Chinese families has over the trust setup is um, the turnaround time and then the succession planning and then the asset protection when, they, when there is a divorce like situation. So this is uh, the concerns that I see from these um, uh, cross borders families. Now, it comes to my third slide. What are the benefits of having a Hong Kong-based provider which could work together with clients to set up structures using the unique features of New Zealand and Cook Island? Well, um, as an independent trustee and being a family-owned organization, in terms of servicing the client, you could consider us as one Asia city group with eight branches instead of a group with eight independent offices. But of course, structure-wise, we are still eight independent offices. I have been with Asia City for around six years. So far, I see the team here in Hong Kong has worked very closely together with New Zealand, Cook Island, and then Singapore team to service our clients. For those clients who choose to set up structures outside of Hong Kong, we could introduce them to Kate and Tinny. Then the Hong Kong team would maintain a face-to-face -face relationship with clients in Hong Kong and in China. We could attend meetings and inquiries locally with clients, handle part of the bank inquiries, for example, the, um, the KYC document requirements on us and some other certifications. In this way, the client would not need to wait Things can happen within the same time zone. They can just use Cantonese and Mandarin to communicate to us. And of course, the Thailand do not have to worry about the cultural differences between, um, between themselves and the trustees. So now let's look at this, uh, the case study we have prepared today. These are actually live cases where we use the structures offered in New Zealand and Cook Island to our ultra high net worth clients with family office in Hong Kong, as well as for the employee benefits trust of a listed company in Hong Kong. Now let's um, pass it on over to Kate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kali. So yes, we have a structure in place at the moment. We've obviously anonymized the name. We've got the gentleman called Mr. Z in this instance. And what we have is a, a New Zealand private trust company. So just to remind everyone, this is a trust company, which is just for the trusts for this family. The director of this trust company is Mr. Z and myself. 
However, it's important to note you can have private trust companies both in the Cook Islands and New Zealand, and it would work just as well in both jurisdictions. What happens is our uh, private trust company is actually owned by a Cook Islands Purpose Trust. So I will pass on later to Tinny, who will talk to you about the Cook Islands Purpose Trust and how it assists the family in this situation. On the um, private trust company, so myself and Mr. Zed are directors. Now, my Chinese is awful. I don't think I can say a single word in Chinese, which is why it's so important that I work with Callie and her team with Mr. Zed. Mr. Zed will speak with Callie and her team they, in Chinese, um, and he will then translate it for us. And a lot of the documents that we see can be in both English and in Chinese, um, either Mandarin or Cantonese. And um, we will then look at the documents and it means that we can both sign the documents in our mother tongue. Um, Callie and her team are also able to assist us when it comes to looking at business practices and the way that Mr. Z works and the way that Mr. Z wants to transact his business. And they're able to bridge that gap between the way that we work in New Zealand and the way that people work in Hong Kong and, and mainline China. Um, under this structure, we actually have three trusts. One's a business trust for their business assets. One's a financial trust for their financial assets. And the third is a trust which holds um, various family um, assets, for example, the family office. But these companies could hold anything. Um, and another way that we, we, we do split up trusts, and this is something that Callie can perhaps talk about a little bit later, is we, we've done this similar type of structure for employee benefit trusts for Chinese companies. And we've had separate trusts so that we can have a trust for employees of that company who live in jurisdictions so that if a disclosure does need to be made to a Chinese government, we're only looking at employees from a certain jurisdiction who are disclosed to the Chinese government or to other governments around the world, which really, again, lends to this idea of geographic diversification. So if we look at each trust, um, the family members and Mr. Z and I are the legal owners of the trust assets and what the trust holds is a holding company and the holding company in some instances can be a Cook Islands company or can be a company um, from one of our other offices. For example, in this case that I'm thinking of with Mr. Z, it's a our Samoan office runs one of the companies. And underneath that holding company are the family's assets. So we, we, we don't get involved in the day-to-day -day running of those family companies in um, China and or in Hong Kong. Callie and her team are there at hand to speak with Mr. Z to talk about um, the way, the things that the trustees need to know about those companies in order for us to discharge our liabilities and for order us to meet our duties under various AML legislation. So that's the way the structure works. Um, the, the way that it works in practice is that Mr. Z and myself haven't actually spoken ever on the phone or directly emailed to one another. That's all done with Cali. So for Mr. Z, Asia City as one team is the director of the company and the provider of the company and the underlying trusts. But for us, it means that we're able to work in different jurisdictions and present a seamless, um, a joined up unified approach to the client. They don't have to speak to different people in different jurisdictions, but we're able to get the necessary expertise and advice in the jurisdictions where the trusts, the businesses, the companies and the clients are based. So I'd like to pass over to Tinny to talk about the Cook Islands Purpose Trust and to talk about about how these kind of trusts can also work in the Cook Islands and the added layers of asset protection that the Cook Islands can offer. So in the, in the case study um, slide, the uh, Cook Islands Purpose Trust owns the um, New Zealand PTC, which acts as trustee for three of the trusts. Now, the, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, the uh, Purpose Trust uh, is a good succession planning tool um, because it's the ownership of the PTC will not be affected by the death of the set law. And if the, the, the set law that set up the, the purpose trust, who also wants to be a director of the PTC, um, passes away, the control, the ownership of the PTC remains with the, um, with the purpose trust and doesn't have to go through uh, probate. So in that way, um, it's a good um, uh, succession planning tool. 
a purpose trust can be created for an indefinite period and an enforcer can be appointed and and the purpose trust can be enforced by the enforcer on the terms set out in the trust instrument. Uh, the trust instrument may contain provisions in relation to the resignation, removal or replacement of the enforcer. And an enforcer can be a person or entity situated in any, any part of the world. The purpose trust for this, in, in this case um, has a purpose rather than beneficiaries and the purpose being to hold the shares in the PTC. Well, thank you for that review of the jurisdictions and useful case study. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome Marcus Dell, who's a leading international family lawyer, to talk on uh, some of the uh, considerations from a family law and international asset protection perspective. Marcus, welcome. Thank you very much indeed, David. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to look today at how to get trust to work well and hand how responsibly and legally to protect assets in a divorce context. Offshore jurisdictions such as the Cook Islands, Cayman, the BVI and Jersey have robust legislation to protect assets. But as we will see, there are many misconceptions about the effectiveness of trusts in protecting assets in international divorce cases. Uh, after 11 years in Hong Kong, um, in December 2020, I moved my base from Hong Kong to London and I continue to practice Hong Kong English law from London. And hopefully you will have read the blurb about me uh, on the site. My firm is Mars Preston & Co, which was, the, was London's first specialist family law boutique uh, founded in 1993. I like to talk about the work we do as family risk advisory. I'm often giving advice in cases prior to any relationship breakdown and focusing minds on the risks in protecting wealth that are not just financial, such as future relationships with children. Remember, it's not just about the money. Let's start with a bit of divorce and trust law. It's now firmly established following the 2014 Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal case uh, of Otto Poon, a case in which I represented the professional trustee for the Jersey Trust HSBC that uh, assets held in a discretionary trust are at risk of being treated by the court as a potential financial resource in divorce proceedings if either or both of the parties are beneficiaries of the trust. The likelihood test remains an important factor, of course, in assisting the family court in making its determination. And that test is if the husband or wife, as the case may be, were to request the trustee to advance to him or her the whole or part of the capital or income of the trust, would the trustee, acting in accordance with its duties on the balance of probabilities, be likely to accede to that request, as set out in the Court of Final Appeals decision? The discretionary trust in Poon was not improperly drafted, as is mistakenly assumed by some in Hong Kong. It was a standard discretionary trust drafted in a similar way to most other discretionary trusts. The Court of Final Appeals decision didn't impact on the more robust asset protection approach afforded by genuinely dynastic trusts, where the settlor is not a beneficiary. It's to these truly dynastic trusts that individuals wishing to try to ring fence assets responsibly should continue to be directed, but it's often a hard sell. The paradox is that substantially wealthy clients in Asia who can easily afford to put a significant part of their wealth aside into dynastic trust structures are usually not prepared to settle the trust without being a beneficiary. Thus, a discretionary trust is chosen despite its asset protection vulnerabilities in a divorce context as shown in Poon. It's essential that when discretionary trusts are set up, advice given to the client is carefully noted to guard against the risk that a client might later assert that those vulnerabilities were not explained sufficiently or at all at the outset and that they were lulled into a false sense of security. Sometimes it transpires that there is truth in these complaints, particularly where a trust was set up through an intermediary more interested in the money in the portfolio account than the suitability of the wrapper the asset was held in. That is why probably the most important message to go with, with today is this. 
if you are getting involved in trust planning for asset protection reasons and you are concerned about divorce, make sure you use pre or post nuptial agreement vehicles or PNAs for short. Trust planning alone will often be insufficient. And I have good news for you on the PNA front. My case of LCYP and JEK, which was handed down to the Hong Kong High Court in July 2019, has clarified the law and provided for the first time much needed guidance about the standard at which the financially weaker party's needs are to be assessed if a PNA is to be considered fair. My team acted for the successful financially stronger husband, and it's now the leading PNA case in Hong Kong. It was also the first reported Hong Kong divorce case in England and Hong Kong, for that matter, involving US discretionary trusts. The trust was situated in Delaware, New York, Florida, and New Jersey. And applying the likelihood test, the judge, Mr. Justice Anthony Chan, held that the assets of the main high value Delaware discretionary trust are the financial resources of the husband. Of major interest for me was the Hong Kong Court of Appeals decision seven days after the JEK judgment. And it was the appeal of another judgment of Anthony Chan Jay in a different case, WYSL. At first instance, Anthony Chan had ruled that the discretionary trust in that case was not a financial resource. And significant, significantly, that finding had not been appealed by either party. But despite the fact that the issue hadn't even been appealed, the Court of Appeal went on independently to apply the likelihood test and held that if it had been necessary to assess the likelihood of the trustee advancing in part of the trust fund to the husband, we are inclined to think, it said, that the trustee would, on the balance of probabilities, be likely to do so and that there may well be good grounds in holding that his interest in the trust should be available as a resource. The majority of um, the divorce and trust cases I'm dealing with in Hong Kong and London now involve offshore trusts. There are similar fact patterns that keep being repeated. Many trustees, settlers, beneficiaries and spouses going through divorce assume firstly that the Hong Kong courts are automatically hostile in trusts, and secondly, that offshore trusts are usually safe from being enforced against in respect of Hong Kong financial orders. The answer to the hostility point is that I don't think that they are. Inevitably, the courts will be unimpressed when parties decide to do, that, to do their asset protection planning five minutes after the marriage has broken down and the divorce petition has been filed. And it's crystal clear from the outset that the strategy is to ensure that the financially weaker party receives virtually nothing from the divorce. I spend quite a lot of time sorting out these types of situations but usually after the horse has bolted. Occasionally I can get in early and stop the implementation of the arrangements. And the answer to the second question is that offshore trusts are not always safe from being enforced against. So working closely with local advisors in the jurisdictions where the trusts are based and with specialist transfer counsel is often key. It's vital to manage expectations realistically, give advice that the settle or beneficiaries need to hear rather than what they want to hear. Make sure those advising have experience in international trust and divorce cases through to trial, both from the attacking and defending viewpoints. And make sure you learn the lessons of the Otto Poon case. Unsurprisingly, trustees and their adv advisors will often be very uncomfortable about having to answer the likelihood test set out in Poon. In Poon, when my team was acting for the trustee, we had a situation where the trustee had not actually been asked by either the husband or wife's lawyers to answer the likelihood test until shortly before the Court of Appeal hearing. The Court of Final Appeal effectively made it clear that if trustees don't answer the likelihood test, the court will determine the answer for them. Another lesson is the trustees should, should not do things on the cheap, and in high value cases, trustees should seek expert independent legal advice. Trustees' records should be carefully kept. Um, as with my JEK case, applications involving Hong Kong trusts are quite often accompanied by applications for Section 17 um, set aside orders. In other words, orders for the setting aside of transfers of assets into and or out of trusts, which are virtually the same as English applications made pursuant to Section 37 of the Matrimonial Causes Act. And in JEK, the wife was applying to set aside significant payments into the trust. The trustee had to prepare trust accounts, from scratch in a hurry under great pressure. In Delaware, it didn't automatically prepare trust accounts, believe it or not. It had made mistakes, which were fortunately, we were fortunately able, 
but at significant further expense to spot. For instance, the trustee disclosed that a five million pound sum had been paid by our client into the trust just after the divorce petition was served on him by his wife. Yet it turned out that that payment was not an external payment at all. The entry was in fact an internal transfer from between two bank accounts already belonging to the trust and that corrected information helped to defeat the section application of the wife in the end. Crucial issues revolve around questions such as whether the trustee should submit to the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong court and working out the ramifications if the trustees are joined into the proceedings, which we don't have time to go into today, sadly. And in the 2000 Court of Appeal case of judge and judge in London, where I advised the trustees in, in connection with the Guer Guernsey Trust, uh, Lord Justice Wilson, as he, as he then was said, trustees, the trustees have been properly defensive. And I think it's very, very important for trustees in divorce cases to be properly defensive generally to get the balance right. So um, here's the Cook Island slide. Uh, it has excellent legislation reserving certain areas of law relating to Cook Island's international trust for Cook Island's law only, prohibiting recognition and enforcement of foreign decisions in these areas. This includes asset protection and divorce concepts but you must always think outside the box and think internationally. The protection is not automatic. It's highly likely to be a mistake, for instance, as we've heard earlier, to do the asset protection planning five minutes after the marriage has broken down and the divorce petition has been filed. That comes with a high risk. In my JEK case, our client could have dissolved his US discretionary trusts and set up Cook Island's trusts, but he did not do so. And he was right not to do so. In the well-known London case of Aquadova recently, solicitors and trustees in the case for the husband have been severely criticised by the High Court in London for getting involved in what the court described as fraudulent schemes. And remember, you cannot guarantee confidentiality. If there are trust orders, uh, trust officers, for, in, in, uh, for in instance, uh, in Cook Island Trust in, in Hong Kong or London, wherever the divorce is filed, they might be subject to court orders to provide trust information and documentation. Very, very briefly, um, a Chinese client lives in China with his wife. The husband sets up a, a, a Cook Islands Trust and an underlying BVI company without getting consent from his wife. There's a bank account opened in both Hong Kong and Singapore uh, under the BVI uh, company with bankable assets and insurance policies. The first question is what happens if there's a creditor in Hong Kong chasing the assets of the husband and secondly what happens if his wife files a divorce in Hong Kong well first off I mentioned that there's a creditor chasing that's not my area of specialism and you would need to go elsewhere for that creditor protection in divorce in a divorce context is very different uh, so you've got to make sure you differentiate between the two Assuming the wife has grounds to file in Hong Kong, she's likely to want to file there. One of the most generous jurisdictions in the world is Hong Kong, the Financial Week Party. She'd need PRC, BVI and Cook Islands advice, as well as Hong Kong law advice. So will the husband. The trustee will also need advice. The bank account in um, Hong Kong might be very vulnerable indeed. The Hong Kong court might treat the trust as a variable nuptial settlement and if it is felt there is a risk that the husband might move the asset away from Hong Kong, the wife might apply for an injunction preventing its removal. Assuming the wife is not a beneficiary of the trust and it's a nuptial settlement, she might threaten, for example, to vary the trust and have herself added as a beneficiary by rewriting the trust deed with the Hong Kong court's assistance. The Cook Up Islands lawyers for the trustees are likely to advise, of course, that a variation order against the trust by the Hong Kong court will be unlikely to be enforced in the Cook Islands. But that advice might be rather academic if the asset is sitting in a Hong Kong bank account and the Hong Kong court can control the asset from Hong Kong, despite the fact that the asset is held in the BVI company, which is held in the Cook Islands Trust. If I was advising the trustee, I would want to take the Cook Islands advice uh, as to whether the trustee should submit to the Hong Kong court and how to handle an application by the wife to join the trustees to the Hong Kong proceedings. If the husband needs to go to Hong Kong for work, it's technically possible in some circumstances for the Hong Kong court to make a prohibit prohibition order preventing the husband from leaving Hong Kong. 
I did that successfully once and it was a very, very effective tool. Also, if the court determines the answer to the proven likelihood test, that it is likely that the trustee will advance funds if asked by the husband to the husband for divorce award purposes, then it might make an order requiring him to pay his wife a large lump sum as a, as a final award, say 50% of the bank account. If he refuses to pay the wife, the wife could then launch a judgment summons and threaten to send him to prison if he doesn't pay up. So there's a lot of a lot for all parties, the husband, the wife, the trustees and the directors of the BVI company to think about and worry about. But I think the husband would probably have been much happier if he'd entered into a prenuptial agreement or postnuptial agreement in tandem with his trust planning. The English and Hong Kong courts are much less likely to intervene and or criticize when parties implement responsible asset protection arrangements involved in the execution, for example, of a pre or postnuptial agreement, which sufficiently covers at the very least the financially weaker party's real need, perhaps in combination with dynastic trust planning. In those circumstances, advisors can take a more robust approach to the asset protection advice they give to clients. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, Marcus. Uh, fantastic insight. And thank you to the uh, Asia City panel for speaking today. We look forward to opening up the floor now uh, for a live Q&A.